I'm A40 here doing a decoding of uh, Bronze Age Pervert. Bronze Age Pervert venerates ancient Greece where man-boy love was the thing. All right, not, not marriage. All right, uh, Bronze Age Pervert doesn't have much time for marriage. Doesn't understand why men would want to waste their time around women. He generally doesn't find women objects of erotic attraction, but uh, young men, that's where it's at. So in ancient Greece, the era that uh, Bronze Age pervert idealizes and venerates and worships, right? The highest form of love in ancient Greece was between men and boys. So Jerry Sandusky seems like uh, perhaps a, an archetype of Bronze Age pervert, right? Jerry Sandusky, great defensive coordinator, very hands-on, wanting to work with boys, very hands-on, cornholing boys in the shower. And that kind of man-boy love seems to be the the energy that drives Bronze Age pervert, just uh, idealizes, the, you know, man-boy love. That's that's really where it's at, staying away from icky women. The other thing that seems to characterize him is that he's dropped his real-life identity, completely submerged himself into trying to make himself an online god and be worshipped online. He's dropped his real-life identity, just merged himself into this online persona. And like Leo Strauss, many Leo Strauss acolytes, uh, Bronze Age pervert believes that he has a secret decoder ring for understanding the ancient thinkers such as Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. So he did his PhD thesis on the problem of tyranny and philosophy in the thought of Plato and Nietzsche, and uh, his dissertation advisor, Stephen Smith, said it was original perspective, but his original perspective purporting that he had the secret decoder ring for what Socrates really meant. So uh, the Bronze Age pervert holds that uh, he knows what Plato really meant, that uh, Plato pers purposefully made Socrates' anti-tyranny argument so weak that he must have intended that his audience side with the defense of tyranny. So Bronze Age pervert thinks that Caligula is a heroic figure, that uh, we should look to tyrants like Caligula. It's kind of the way forward. So like uh, Mencius Moldbug and uh, his veneration of monarchy. So Mencius Moldbug has, has no time for democracy, for messy relationships like that. He just wants a kin, king to rule over us, right? It's a fantasy delusional world by, that uh, unsurprisingly comes from people who spend a great deal of time online and very interested in creating their own online persona more interested in creating online persona than real world corrections so the the bloke behind bronze age pervert essentially gone silent in the real world since 2018 so he can devote himself to promoting a homoerotic man boy you know love as the highest ideal form of human interaction and promoting the rule of tyrants and uh, substituting for Democratic rule, the rule of uh, military figures. So we discussed the Bronze Age pervert on the book club that we did on my show once a week for about two years with Kevin Michael Grace. This is from my show, June 22, 2018. 3 p.m. Pacific time and uh, the book this week. It's a hard one to be indifferent about. If you pick this book up, I, I reckon you'll either love it or hate it. There's a book called The Bronze Age Mindset. And uh, Kevin Michael Grace chose it. Kevin, why did you choose this book? I thought it would be fun. I know very little about Bronze Age uh, pervert. Uh, I, I suspect that very few people do, and this is deliberate. On his part, uh, he calls his book a manifesto. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me uh, read something from a Vox article, and we all know about Vox, so, you know, come Grano Salas. Nobody knows who Bronze Age pervert is, but among a subset of internet denizens, he's something of a demigod, a Jordan Peterson in miniature. He was well-known enough for the neo-reactionary and proto-alt-right thinker Curtis Yarvin, better known by his pseudonym Mencius Moldbug, to name-check and a uh, question in the, in the chat. Does 40 have an inspiring vision of the future? Is it just get married, have kids, and die? Yeah, I have an inspiring vision of the future, and that is today your actions are in harmony, right? That you do the things that you want to do, you avoid doing the things that you don't want to do, that the different parts of your life work together, that you play an important role in the lives of people around you, that you are loved by people around you, and you love them, and you live a life that's in harmony with your values. So you don't state certain values and then live a life completely contradictory, but instead your life, your actions, your beliefs, the various sectors of your life kind of all work together so that you can have the best possible relations with the people 
who are in your life. That's, that's my heroic vision of the future, right? Where you, you do what you say, you say what you do, you mean what you say, you say what you mean as appropriate to the context and the situation, and you're not doing things, you know, in private, you'd be ashamed of being known publicly that uh, what you do in church and what you do in synagogue and what you do at the bar, what you do at a stadium, what you do with your friends, with your acquaintances, with your work colleagues, with people in various communities that you're a part of, that it all basically works together. So I have a vision of a harmonious life. And that, that vision contains five to 15 hours a week uh, volunteering, helping out other people. So every day you should be doing things that you can feel good about that are not just the selfish fulfillment of your own basic needs. That's my vision. I came in a recent interview with an Atlantic journalist telling Rosie Gray that Bronze Age Pervert was his contact inside the White House. Well, this seems to have been an attempt to troll Gray. It speaks to Bronze Age Pervert's relative notoriety within this type of community. Content. Now, this writer does not know what notoriety means. Notoriety is a bad thing, not a good thing. And furthermore, it is clear from reading this book that... Uh... Uh, Kevin, uh, Luke says that uh, the life I describe is not really heroic. Well, to the people who are positively affected by what I'm doing, for the people for whom I play a role in helping them break out of deadly addictions and compulsions. For some of them, it's absolutely heroic. For people who need my help and I provide it, it's heroic. For the people who benefit from when I extend myself and commit myself to causes and volunteer opportunities and, and commitments, you know, greater and above myself. Yeah, it's, uh, it's heroic that uh, other people get to benefit. Sometimes, you know, reasonably large number of people, 100, 200, 300 people get to benefit when I put their welfare ahead of my own for a few hours a week. So if you need people and people are there to help you out, uh, most people find that uh, verging on the heroic. When people look forward to seeing you, when you lift people up consistently, when you are overwhelmingly a source of joy rather than a source of aggravation and depression in people's life, and you're a source of joy because you have joy, yeah, people tend to find that really good, if not verging on the heroic, if you can bring that day in, day out. If you can be someone who's at ease with yourself, and therefore at ease with other people, at ease with reality, so that people find themselves relaxing when they're around you, when people find themselves letting their hair down, where people feel like they can be open and honest around you, where they don't have to pretend, where they don't have to put on a persona, where they don't have to you know, claim to be one thing when they're really something else. And that, that release of unnecessary tension and aggravation uh, just unleashes you know, joy and uh, souls coming out of hiding. Yeah, many people find that heroic rather than creating a fake online persona claiming that you have the secret decoder ring to the ancients, that uh, the highest form of love is between men and boys, that we really need more tyrants like Caligula ruling over us. Yeah, I would say that uh, I, I prefer my presentation of the heroic to the veneration of homoerotic love between men and boys as being greater than the love in, in a nuclear family. I would uh, say that the veneration of, of tyrants like Caligula is an inferior version, an inferior vision to what I share on this channel. He is not like Jordan Peterson because Jordan Peterson is an Apollonian and Bronze Age pervert is clearly a Dionysian. And what, what are the main differences between Apollonian and Dionysian? Well, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, Apollonian stands for order and Dionysian stands for disorder. Yeah. I mean, it's much more complicated than that. But uh, one might say that an Apollonian is devoted to reason, whereas a Dionysian is devoted to uh, passion. Uh, the most famous Dionysian of our age uh, is Jim Morrison of the Doors. He's been celebrated uh, for that by many people. There's a cult. But 40, any inspiring vision for the future of humanity? Well, it helps if you pay your bills, if you have good relations with other people, you make consistent, solid you know, pro-social decisions to free up time in your life to then devote to poetry, to music, to thinking about society, politics, philosophy, art, all right? So if you are creating space for that in your life because of the positive choices that you make, because of the self-discipline that you show, 
because you have set aside savings, because you choose to create time for yourself to explore ideas, to join communities, to build your relationships with other people who are similarly, you know, inspired or similarly want to you know, guide humanity in a, in a better direction, all right, then you can build on the positive choices. But if your personal life is a mess, if you're getting deeper and deeper into debt, if you rely upon welfare, if you're a sucker on, if you suck on the teeth of your family or of your community or of your nation, right? I, I am highly skeptical of, you know, any contributions you're going to make towards the future of humanity. Possible, but uh, first, as Jordan Peterson says, clean your room, get your own life clean, organized, lead a life that's in harmony, not at war. And out of that, out of the good connections that you build and a life that is interwoven with the lives of other people, you're far more likely to produce a vision for the future that is useful and accords with reality rather than a delusional homoerotic worship me and suck me off vision that's venerate tyrants present, presented by Bronze Age pervert, you know, the, the Jerry Sandusky of the alt-right. Around him because of that. You know, reading this book, I, I was struck by something that uh, the great uh, critic Lester Bangs uh, once uh, said to Cameron Crowe, that he talked, he asked him about what typewriter he used and they were talking about writing and Lester Banks says somebody to the effect that uh, he liked to take meth and he'd just, you know, like type 25 pages, you know, just to write, you know. And it struck me that this book is not so much of a manifesto and more of a prose poem or a, a fever dream, if you will. Yeah. I mean, there are so many misspellings in the book that uh, I assume that, that, that there's a point to them. Well, I, I got the impression that uh, this fellow is not a native English speaker. I also got the impression that he comes from the uh, f former Soviet empire, either from uh, Russia itself or from one of the countries of the Warsaw Pact. I mean, the, the Slavic speakers have a big problem with the article. Uh, they will frequently not use the word the where it should be used. Yeah, this is, uh, this is smart here from Kevin deducing that uh, Bronze Age pervert came from East, Eastern Europe. He came from Romania, moved to the United States at... Uh, age 10. So you can often tell a great deal about a guru, a thought leader, a live streamer by the quality of the people he attracts. And Bronze Age Pervert you know, attracts this rabid audience you know, that is highly reactive to the slightest you know, criticism of their hero. So one of the signs that you're dealing with someone who's bad for you is if they cultivate this unnecessarily strong in-group, out-group identity where the in-group is those who listen to them and worship them and, and follow them. And to the extent that I have a following, I would not want to have a, a rabid following. Right? I would not want people wasting their energy defending me. I sometimes have good points to make. I often have daft points to make. I frequently have no points to make. <laughs> uh, and, and so too with you know anyone else who, who does what what I do. Like, at times, you're going to have a good point in a certain situation. You might have something useful, relevant, even cutting and incisive. Plenty of the time, you'll be absolutely daft and, and wrong. And uh, much of the time, you'll just be mediocre. But there's this rabid in-group versus out-group mentality fostered by Bronze Age pervert that uh, highly reacts against you know, the slightest criticism of, of their hero. I, I think that's unhealthy, along with this delusional idea that he's got the personal decoder ring to the ancients like Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, and uh, what uh, the author of The Prince, Niccolo Machiavelli. I think that's absurd. And they will frequently insert thes will, where they should not be used. I mean, to a certain extent, his, his language, his written language is highly stylized, but again, there are a great number of uh, gross grammatical errors, which I suppose could be deliberate, but that would indicate a really high uh, level uh, of accomplishment to pull that sort of thing off over a 138 uh, page book. And I will point out that the book is only 138 pages, well, at least in my uh, ebook edition, but it is actually longer than that because there are very few paragraphs. Yeah. How, how did you hear about Bronze Age pervert in, in the first place? Do you remember? I don't. He was one of those people who seemed to uh, rise up in 2016 or uh, at the same time uh, Ricky Vaughn did. And you know that there was a cult that, that arose around him. That's really all I know about him. That's a bad sign. All right, someone who comes online, stays anonymous, devotes himself to, to building an online persona, uh, inviting worship, you know, very similar to Nick Fuentes and uh, Richard Spencer, 
uh, someone who submerges their real self in an online persona, not a good sign. And what did you think of the book? Well, I think that it, it rather reminds me of the French novelist Louis Fernand Céline, who, whom he name checks uh, in, in the text, although it, it's far more anarchic uh, than Céline. There is a sort of a, a fury to it, to the narrative. And as well, as opposed And what's the basis of the fury? The basis of the fury is that this world has not accorded the author of Bronze Age mindset, the respect and adulation and status that he feels like he deserves. He feels like he is a superior man, but in real life, he cannot be a superior man. In real life, he's an oddball. He's an eccentric who lacks normal, genuine human connections. And so out of this fury that he hasn't been accorded the, the proper veneration, status, respect, prestige that he feels he is rightly owed comes the, the, the furious output. To Celine, a lot of it seems crazy or deliberately crazy, like he's attempting to troll us. For instance, there's a section of the book where he's talking about geographers lying to us. For instance, And uh, Luke Croft says Richard Spence was always open about his name and views. Was he open about how... He welcomed people hailing him with, uh, you know, hail, hail Spencer or uh, C. Kyle, right? I, I don't think he was quite open about how much he venerated the Nazi adulation that he received in private. He, he tried to keep that private. He tried to present a reasonable figure to the public, to the mainstream media in private. He lapped up as much Nazi adulation as he could whip up. Don't think he wanted to make public how he was sleeping with the girlfriends of his followers. Don't think he wanted to make public his extensive, you know, drug and alcohol abuse. So I think there was a great deal of Richard Spencer's life that he tried to keep on the down low. Since that the earth is actually much smaller than we think it is. And, and I, I don't mean smaller in a metaphorical sense. I mean, in a literal sense. Also that many cities in the world are actually the same. Now, this could be argued metaphorically, but the book... And uh, the chat says Richard Spencer admires Napoleon more than Hitler. At least that's what he says publicly. In his private life, he got, you know, he would take and whip up and seek out every bit of hit Hitler adulation as he could possibly receive. He, he deliberately took the alt right, which was formerly known as a bunch of merry pranksters, and as closely as he could intertwined it with the Nazi outlook. And privately, he would, you know, whip up storms of people seekiling him. That's what got him off. Argues as if it uh, were literal. Do you think that uh, Bronze Age pervert is Mencius Moldbug? Oh, I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've read Moldbug, and I, I stopped reading him for this reason. I, I thought, I'm a pretty clever fellow, but I have no idea what this guy's on about. When I do figure out what uh, Manchester Smallbug is on about, I realize he doesn't know nearly as much as he thinks he does. So Manchester Smallbug, Curtis Yarvin, right, makes all sorts of grand pronouncements about topics he doesn't know very much about. I'm no scholar of World War II, but when he starts talking about World War II, you know, I realize that he knows even less than I do. I realize that he knows even less than I do in all sorts of areas, and yet he feels completely confident making all sorts of grand sweeping pronouncements. So my experience of Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Mention Small Bug, is either I don't have a clue what he's talking about, it's just you know, so abstruse and so poorly written, or when I do know what he's talking about, it doesn't stand up to critical scrutiny. Uh, Dennis Dale, welcome to the show. Do you have any thoughts on the Bronze Age mindset? Yeah, uh, you know, it was fun in parts. Um, you know, I, in parts not. Um, you know, some of his arguments, arguments are brilliant, and sometimes it's just silly. That part about history, Kevin, and the geography thing. Yeah, it, you know, it's weird. It just strikes me is that we have to learn how to read all over again because people now will dip in and out of trolling and stuff, which is what I think this guy does here. Or he might just lead you into it. At some point, you're following along with him, and all of a sudden, he says some crazy thing like, uh, you know, who knows, right, if Rio de Janeiro is not actually New York or some crazy stuff like this. But it's a lot of fun in his critique of, you know, so-called scientism. It's the usual stuff, but it's very powerful. Um, I wanted to say something about, you mentioned history. He falls into the trap that, that Nietzsche did. And of course, you could look at this book as simply a gloss on Nietzsche, if you wanted to. This idea that there is no such thing as truth. Well, Roger Scruton pointed out that um, then this would obviously have to be true of the person who made the claim. And if any person makes such a claim, um, one should stop paying attention. He goes on at great length about how what we know, for instance, about the ancient world 
uh, could have been cobbled together by later scribes, uh, for instance, Christian scribes. But then he goes on to quote at great length about the ancient world. Right. And there's also, I don't know, that this confusion about ancient religion, about, for, for instance, Greek mythology, he weaves in and out of this, and this may be deliberate, one doesn't really know whether he believes that these gods are real or not. Well, yeah, I I'm not even certain of the level of his religious. He has religious sentiment. I don't feel like he has religious belief. He keeps pointing out the holes in... A lot like uh, Jordan Peterson. I mean, Jordan Peterson's an atheist who devotes himself to promoting Christianity, but he himself is absolutely bored, silly, participating in Christianity. And so... Uh, Bronze Age pervert w likes to wrap himself in, in the mantle of religion when, when it's convenient, but uh, I suspect he would be absolutely bored to death actually trying to live Christianity. Logic, reason, you know, the gaps that we've all been talking about, you know, we were talking about with the last book. And, and, but he doesn't really provide anything. He says, well, there's the Greek gods over there, and there's that tradition over there. Traditions he might as well trash, like the Christian tradition in another context, you know, so. He doesn't understand the Christian tradition at all. He talks about going to churches and being bored. Now, he makes a great deal in the book about sacrifice, and he evidently does not know, because it would appear he has no knowledge of the Catholic or Orthodox tradition, that uh, Orthodox Christianity is based on a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Mass, which Christians, Orthodox Christians, believe to be real. Right. Devin, yeah. did you have further thoughts? Because uh, you were just getting started there. when I interrupted you. No, you were interrupted by. So do you have f f further thoughts, Dennis? Well, no, I mean, here's another thing. He talks about the, the hatred of beauty, which has existed through all time and space, apparently. But remember, that his beauty is boys, right? The, the greatest form of beauty for him is uh, boys, young men, right? And the greatest form of love, as in ancient uh, Egypt and as in what Jerry Sandusky had, is the, the, the love and the eros between grown men and boys. He doesn't seem to know about the Middle Ages then, because the Middle Ages, uh, beauty was venerated. And you have a situation where, uh, say, the Vikings, my ancestors, uh, the pirates that he so admires, were invited to take over Normandy, which they did, and in a very short order, were spending vast sums of money to build the most beautiful buildings the world has ever seen. Yeah, this distinction he makes is not real um, between the pirate and the farmers. He has nothing but disdain for the mass. Uh, where does he think this elite emerges from, you know? Well, one, sorry to interrupt, but one other thing in that respect. Now, he likes the Greeks a lot, the ancient Greeks, and he talks about wine and their use of wine, but wine is agricultural. Non-agricultural people have very primitive forms of alcohol. Wine is not a primitive form of alcohol. Right. Uh, anyway. Dennis, I, I want to get all of your thoughts on the book, so we're not going to interrupt you. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh, no, I was just listening to Kevin. Kevin's got a lot better stuff than me. Well, go on. A lot of scattered notes. Well, right. go ahead, Kevin's got scattered notes. Dennis. Did you guys talk about the fact that um, Sailor, I, I found this old post from Sailor, Somebody found out that um, Steve Bannon was reading Moldbug, and Moldbug sort of rickrolled them. He directed them to Bronze Age Pervert. Yeah, and that might have been where that uh, that rumor started. But I also heard it might have been Jack Donovan. Is that the guy's name? Yeah, that's this his name. Gay masculinist dude. Yeah, uh, Jack Donovan leading homosexual in the alt-right. But Bronze Age Pervert doesn't... Uh, is this guy gay? I don't even know. I mean, everything about this is very gay in that theme, but he, he hates uh, homosexuality, apparently. Well, modern gayness. Right. I think he makes that quite clear. Just effeminate gayness. And he has a very bizarre and I, I think just totally wrong theory about gay. This profusion of gay behavior now is a kind of reaction to our matriarchy, to this, the owned space, he calls it, of, of matriarchy. And all these guys are guys that would be out conquering, but they're, you know. I question why there's so many gay men in the distant right. One, you get to play dress up. Uh, two, it doesn't matter that you don't have a nuclear family. All right. If you have a wife and you have kids, you're going to be far less likely to participate in distant politics. But if you don't have a wife and a kid, your kids, you're going to be much more looking for excitement. So I get my excitement in, in large part doing live streams like this. I also you know, delve into distant politics. I have a much greater need for excitement than a guy who's married with, with a wife and kids. All right? If you're married with a wife and kids, you're not out there looking for excitement. You get pretty much the, all the excitement you need from your family instead adopting this homosexual i don't buy that i think a lot of these guys are adopting homosexuality because they're just quitting because they can't keep up i mean they're just confused in this matriarchy but it's not like these are the conquering spirits that's what i don't see in, in a lot of these guys but anyway i just i can't follow where he's you know stands on anything you know uh, it's a lot of fun to read him but like i said uh, 
where does he think um, this elite is going to emerge from? Uh, he has such contempt for common people. Um, and again, I don't know whether to take him seriously. You don't know when he's trolling or not. Well, you know, this goes back to the Ubermensch of, of Nietzsche again. Well, like you said, it's all a gloss on Nietzsche. It's Nietzsche is a little bit Camille Paglia. And there's one more that I was thinking of earlier. That well, he, he game checks Schopenhauer uh, several times. You mentioned Jack Donovan. He does not, Bronze Age Pervert does not share the rather um, gross and, and insane misogyny uh, of Donovan. Uh, he does have a very strong hatred of uh, matriarchy, which he sees at the uh, central to the modern bug man way of living. And I think he's absolutely right about that. Uh, we got a super chat from Brindlefly. He says, would Kevin Michael Grace prefer to live in the stone, bronze or iron age, which is the best age for being a pervert? Mm -hmm. Also, what brand of cigarettes is best? Uh, the cigarette question is easy to answer for me. Uh, my preferred brand is uh, Jitan, but uh, you can't get them anymore or it's very difficult to uh, get them. I, I wouldn't want to live in any of those uh, ages. And it, it's not a question that I could possibly entertain. I mean, uh, leaving aside the fact that, you know, when, when people, even Bronze Age pervert, they, they talk about um, prehistorical ages. What do we know about them? I mean, yeah. he, he makes a lot of the, the ignorance, the learned ignorance of scientists, but again, you know, falling into the same trap. Right. Our, our knowledge of, of, of prehistory is obviously uh, minimal. Well, and he tries to argue at some point that it's totally untrustworthy because people could have excised entire centuries, right, and just inserted. Well, we knew that, you know. That's this, well, there must be a name for this fallacy, but we see it introduced, this uncertainty fallacy, where people would introduce it as if it's not, you know, if it doesn't affect their side equally of whatever it is they're saying. But yeah, oh, I, just, I, My version of history is right. Every other, every, everyone else's version of history is, is wrong. I just wanted to mention one other thing. Okay, so I was so inspired by talking about Bronze Age Pervert, I started streaming at about 6.50 this morning. Let me fast forward to more from this show that uh, I did with Kevin Michael Grace, Dennis Dale, Casey on June 22nd, 2018. Right, sexual freedoms is that now all these awesome things to do, you know, to, to go do with other guys. Is I sure they're more expressive, unless we decide we're going to call ourselves what we are, white people, uh, and, you know, in a in more expressive, louder and all that's great. I love them. I'm kind of for white are banging on drums in the city center and you know dancing and singing and it seems it seems quite lively to me and it also seems authentic like authentically theirs or ours whereas you know i don't know that i could just show up at a um like one of duvid's interfaith like at a hindu temple like i'm always and uh luke croft says are there any good parts of bronze age pervert yes he, he is he's brilliant he is learned he is steeped in the ancient Greeks who had some thought provoking philosophy. And th there, there are times when he has, you know, some pretty sharp uh, provocations, all right? Things that uh, make you think a second time, kind of, you know, stop you in your tracks. It's gonna feel like an outsider. So what we have to do is to find it within ourselves. And that's what I'm assuming Bronze Age, Bronze Age pervert is a white guy. Can we assume that? Do yes. Yeah. So if, if so, like, um, you know, the, the Greeks did this, right? This was the mystery school came out of there. And I don't know, I'm just, uh, just a guy hoping that a new Messiah shows up. For the don't, don't fall for this business that you're a white guy, that you're some bland thing, you know? It, yeah, I mean, the Southern people like Luke's talking about are more expressive, louder, and all that's great. I love them. I'm kind of, I kind of thrive in that environment myself. But our people. So I was reading or listening to a New York Times article on self-help guru, the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. And he lived for many years in Latin America because he came from a relatively repressed, according to him, you know, Anglo-Saxon upbringing. And so he really enjoys how emotionally expressive Latin Americans are. And as someone who came from an Anglo-Saxon upbringing myself and who, who treasures my you know, Anglo-Saxon family and that civilization, yeah, I've enjoyed uh, Jewish culture, which is much more emotionally expressive. So I understand by people who come from a more emotionally repressed uh, upbringing can enjoy you know, dipping into experimenting with traveling around a more emotionally expressive upbringing. Not that there aren't many wonderful things about the Northern European civilization. People are quieter, modest, reserved. And, it's, and, and fuck those goddamn Southerners. We're not gonna fucking copy those assholes. Fuck them. I'm tired of hearing of this shit. We need to preserve our way. And there's a way that is suited for you, Manic, and me because it's in our goddamn genes and it's been evolved. Yes, it's evolved over centuries in us. We're suited toward a way of life that is gentler, kinder than this fucking hell hole they're, they're visiting upon us. And these other people are gonna beat us because they're stronger, they're more cohesive, they're louder, they're brasher, they're more expressive, unless we decide we're gonna call ourselves what we are, white people, uh, and, you know, in a, in, in a sort of war with these others. Uh, 
yeah, I don't think that that mindset that we're white people at war with non-white people is a useful mindset uh, to the extent that people identify anything like what Dennis is talking about. People identify as English, they identify as French, they identify as German or Norwegian or Swiss or Canadian or Australian or, or American, right? Very few people in the United States, North, North America, Australia, Europe identify primarily as white and feel at war with the non-whites around them. That's not going to be a, an adaptive strategy for most people, right? Most people get their primary sense of meaning from their community, from their family, from their religion. So people identify as Protestant, as Presbyterian, as, as Methodist, as Seventh-day Adventist, as Anglican or, or Roman Catholic or, or Jewish, or they identify with their family and their extended family or their profession, right? Not many white people feel like they are at war with non-whites. And life in first world countries, right, is not really suited for a white person to go out there with an attitude of, you know, we're at war with, with non-whites. It's not a, usually an adaptive strategy. And defend these values of modesty and, and you know, a more yeah, chaste. Yeah. I'd like to live in a Jane Austen world. I like that world. I like 1950s America. Uh, I, I like the stiff upper lip. I grew up in Australia where you did not, men did not cry, where you did not spill over with emotion. But what you had is your mates. You had very strong ties with your mates in Australia because everyone was white and everyone basically was of Northern European heritage uh, dominantly. And so you had a cohesive uh, community and, and mateship was just very strong. And so someone was making an absurd comment in the chat that I have something against uh, friendship or closeness between men. The very opposite. Uh, what I love about traditional ways of life is that it, it makes forming close bonds